How's it going? You know, it is going great. Just, it's going great. Um, I have returned recently to using uh, this particular planner that's designed for people with ADHD. It's uh, called a Panda Planner. And it has just helped me with a million different tasks on my list uh, and a, a bunch of different hats that I'm wearing in, in small projects that I'm getting paid for. It's really helping me stay organized. And I am super grateful for that. And by halfway through the day, I feel like I'm really accomplishing something. And that is wonderful. So mm. I feel like I'm accomplishing things today. How are you wow. doing? That's fantastic. I am, I'm actually doing really well. We have had some unusually cool weather the last couple of days. And so I've got a hoodie on in the middle of August and I love mm. it. Um, and then Shelly and I got away this weekend to the beach. It was not necessarily meant to be a husband and wife trip, but our kids are at such an age where we just have to say, this is what we're doing and come if you can. And <laughs> all of our kids were like, yep, I'm busy. And so we're like, okay, we'll see ya. We're at the beach. So it was great. We got a couple of days alone. We went for a hike. We had a wonderful time. Again, it was cool at the beach. So we got to wear hoodies and yeah, it was great. That's amazing. I love that kind of weather. I just love it. Yes. I, I completely agree. It's why I live in Oregon. We don't have all of the humidity in the summer. We have really beautiful fall weather uh, with good, I don't know, sit by the fire, wood stoves. I can't wait for all of that. But mm. we're getting a little taste by putting on a hoodie right in the middle of August. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah. So I understand you've got something a little different for us today. Yeah. You know, I mentioned when I started talking today that I have a bunch of different hats that I'm wearing, kind of little projects that I'm getting paid for. Uh, one of those hats is that I am teaching a class at Evangel University on church business and law this fall. And oh, aren't you going to be the most popular professor on campus? Yes, yes. I am so excited because, of course, nobody wants to take the theology classes. Nobody wants to take, take the preaching classes. Uh, what they really signed up for a ministry degree to take is church business and law. And so, you're that guy. Yes, I'm, I am the guy. Oh. Uh, and I could not be more impressed with myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm but, very impressed with you too. Yes, as well you should be. But, uh, you know, while I have been prepping for this class, in the last two weeks, I have had a number of folks, without knowing that I'm actually teaching this class, bring up this idea of church business. And they all mean slightly different things, and they all have slightly different takes. And I just think it's a fascinating conversation topic to ask, what do we mean by putting the two words church and business together as if it were one phrase? Well, I think it depends on what you mean. And, and clearly, you're already alluding to that. But I think the natural place to go is, oh, so you mean a CEO model of church, where we're basically modeling the church structure on business structures, and we're going to turn the church into a business. And I think that's the easy default re reaction. And I'm assuming that's not actually what you mean. That's a great point. You know, uh, I had not thought about that at all. I've been too involved in church business for too long. It didn't even occur to me that that's what it would mean. And you're right. That's not what I mean at all. I, I, I don't mean let's wholesale model a church's organization on a business in which there is a CEO president at the top. And then that follows up with a bunch of kind of C-suite titles 
chief operating officer, chief financial officer, whatever, or even people who have those specific responsibilities, I definitely don't mean that. Though, when you bring this up, one of the things that's interesting to me is that churches, in order to exist, they do have to have a structure. And in the United States, there are legal requirements for that structure. And a piece of what we mean by church business is understanding what it means to flesh out an organization within the systems and structures that are laid out for us in the law. And mm. that, that is a piece of it, and, and it does matter. And I think that's probably one of the things that's interesting is, does it really matter whether or not a church does things in the legally laid out way, which would be setting itself up as a, a nonprofit, a 501c3? So that's a piece of it. But when you think of church business, what else comes to your mind? I'm curious because I hadn't thought of the CEO model as kind of a starting point. What else comes to your mind when you think of the phrase church business? Boring. Uh, that is what I think. Like I think of well, Baptists have love to have good long business meetings, and they're just pure drudgery, and only your most dedicated people come to them. And uh, so, I, I guess I think boring. I think irrelevant to the gospel. And me personally, I have kind of two competing thoughts that go into it because. Professionally, I don't run a church. I am a 911 dispatch supervisor. So I think of government and I think of policies and laws and standard operating procedures and all of these things that are dull, dull, dull and soul crushing, right? Like sometimes I, as a supervisor, have to do things a certain way in the name of equity. Like we always treat our employees this way. We always respond with this level of discipline to this thing. And it's like, yeah, but what about the unique circumstances of this situation? Well, sorry, in the name of fairness and in the name of following the procedure, we have to do this. And it's like, goodness gracious, can we just treat people like human beings? So there's that side of it. But then our staff also really craves up-to-date, clear policy because they know they're doing a life and death job. And if you're doing a life and death job, you need to know that if it goes south, you did it the way you were told to do it. And so don't come looking at me. And so in order to re decrease their liability, they kind of live and die off of these policies. So we have to craft them very, very well. So I see both the good and the bad of policy and HR and laws. But then when you when you marry it with the church, you're going, but do these things even belong together? Yeah, no, this is exactly it. And and I I think you said a moment ago that one of the reasons policies have to exist is because if they don't and something goes sideways, the employee may be out in the middle of nowhere in big, big trouble. And I actually ran across a church case of this. Have you ever have you ever heard of a law, a love offering? Oh yeah, so, for sure. Of course, right? So recently a pastor went to jail because the church was actively taking love offerings for the pastor and it was not done correctly. And the reason this matters is because when people give to a church, even in terms of a love offering, inherently they have certain expectations about what their money is going towards. And in this case, the money wasn't going towards anything ministry related. It was going to his personal life. You know, it was paying his cable bill and for his insurance and his house and all of those kinds of things. And so he got in really big trouble. And I, I'm struck by two things. Number one, churches handle money all the time. Yeah. Youth pastors collect money for trips and 
Uh, we give love offerings, and every Sunday there's money that's dumped in a bucket because uh, that sounds like a good plan. Uh, <laughs> and right, and one of the reasons policy matters is because just because you're the person passing the plate, just because you're the youth pastor, just because you're the person receiving the love offering, doesn't mean you have thought through all the implications of your actions. And policy exists to protect you from things you may not have even thought of. And yeah. that's a really big deal, right? Yeah, no, it totally is a big deal. And I, I suspect as you tell these stories, because uh, I can't imagine that's the only story you have here, I, I just, I'm so tempted to dig into the details of every single story. Like, because with the pastor that got arrested, was he also drawing a salary? Because it seems like all of those things would be perfectly appropriate uses of that money if it were just a salary. But yeah, and and I don't know the details. I happen to subscribe to a website that sends emails out, and that was the latest email update from that particular website. So I don't have all the details on that story. But yes, exactly. Well, and this is where if there was a policy that covered the situation, it would help define those things. My suspicion is that there simply was no intentional plan. And policy helps you treat people and situations consistently. You used that word earlier. Uh, or did you use the word consistency or the word equity? Yeah, probably both. Uh, because I think those two things can overlap, though they don't always. Mm -hmm. And I think we struggle with that in the government world of we want to be consistent employee to employee on how we respond to things. But we also want to be equitable. And to some extent, equity takes into consideration the exact situation that's being faced, not just the generalized thing that might be applicable from person to person. And that's really what mm. policy will end up doing is it it tries to be specific, but if it's overly specific, then it, it's not broad enough to catch a variety of situations. But then if it's too broad, then you don't know how to apply it in certain situations. So I don't know. I feel like equity and consistency always need to live in tension when applying policy or even writing policy. That's good. Um, you know, and it's funny, you come from the government world where maybe there's a tendency to too much, too specific policy is what I think I hear you saying. It can you're be being very constricting. No, you're exactly right. It's too much. There's a lot of red tape. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, in the church world, frequently, particularly in smaller and mid-sized churches that I have had access to, and obviously I'm painting with a broad brush here. I'm not saying this is true of every church, but many of the churches that I've talked to, they've never covered basic policy or HR expectations. So simple things, I mean, things like, do you provide a job description to your staff members so that they know when they are being successful and when they aren't? Often the answer is no. Really? Frequently, you will hear pastors laugh, almost looking down their noses at the idea of a job description. <laughs> Man, I used to have a job description, but how could you capture what I'm supposed to do in a job description? But the problem is, if you can't capture it in writing, how do you know if you're doing it or not? How can you be confident that the organization, the lead pastor who's in charge, and potentially whatever staff member we're talking about are all on the same page? If it can't get written down, all three parties might be throwing darts at different dartboards and not even knowing it. Well, and even more than that, I just think of, uh, you know, to borrow a phrase from the military, mission creep. Right. This is where we're not staying focused on your individual role. And I think I've heard this complaint from pastors in the past that, you know, the congregation just expects me to do all these things. And, you know, well, if you could actually write down a job description 
and make it clear what the expectations are and what the expectations are not, maybe then there wouldn't be this mission creep where it just, you keep getting added, you know, more and more and more and more responsibility. Well, absolutely. Mission creep and sort of mission deviation. Because I yeah. think that happens as well. The number of times I've talked to a lead pastor and one of their frustrations about their their staff is, I mean, they're not doing the things I want them to do. To which my response is, do they have a job description? Well, no, because it's really hard to get it in print. So you're telling me you don't have the time or the capacity to write it down, and yet you're surprised that they're not doing it? <laughs> well, and I think about even down to expectations uh, that are not necessarily uh, like code of conduct expectations that mm -hmm. as an employee of this church, you will adhere to these things. Like I remember specifically the fact that at one of your churches, maybe all of the churches you've been a part of, um, the staff was held to an expectation that they would not drink alcohol of any sort mm -hmm. uh, in any variety. And I have an occasional drink and you respectfully said, hey, when you're with me, can you just refrain with me? Uh, I don't want it to be confusing to our folks. And absolutely, of course. Um, and so, but that was an expectation. I don't know if it was written down in your unique context, but it was one of many code of conduct expectations that really you're doing a favor to your staff if you write them down and they know in advance, this is what you're being held to. Yeah. Well, co and, and I think churches do better on the code of conduct stuff because, you know, it's moral and so whatever. What is less often clear is how many vacation days does this person have? What are personal days supposed to be used for? How many personal days does he or she have? And this sounds like, well, you know, they should just take what they need, whatever. But And if that's the policy, write it down. That's fine. But boy, I know a lot of pastors who the day after a giant event that took three months to plan, if they knew they had X number of personal days and it was super, super clear, they, they would do well to take a personal day because they just crushed themselves. Um, well, and that's where and, not being a pastor, I start thinking about, well, what about flex time? Because if I spent 20 hours yesterday working on this big thing, I got up at six in the morning and I didn't finish until midnight. So I guess that's 18 hours, but I worked for 18 hours straight, setting up, taking down, doing the thing, whatever. Like, doesn't that count as time worked? Like, can I just take the next day off without burning any vacation time? And I think this is exactly what, and here's the thing that I think that makes this so valuable. When you write those kinds of things down, what you are saying is our staff are human beings we want to care for. Our pastors are people, and they need to be treated like people, not just agents of the mission. And that's ultimately what HR is really about in a local church. Uh, it's about treating our highest level people, our, our paid team, as if their spiritual lives, their emotional lives, their mental health, their physical well-being all matter. And so let's create a plan before we're in the middle of chaos about what that needs to look like. Yeah, I, I love this. And I think you're right. It is honoring to the staff um, and all of that. But I guess I'm now starting to think, okay, that's all well and good for the staff and HR policies. But what about church-wide policies and why would that matter to your average attendee? That's great. So you you teach Sunday school, right? Yeah. Or something like that. Yep. Yeah. Sunday school to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Sunday school to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. How often are you alone in the room with those fourth, fifth, and sixth graders? Never. Uh, we have uh, a policy huh, of uh, two... Two people in, oh, wait, hang on. That's not true. That is not true. Yeah, there are times where they haven't staffed a helper. And so though there are windows on the doors and people can see in, I have been the solo teacher in that classroom multiple times. 
I've never been alone one on one with a student, but I have been one on many in in the classroom. So we're we're seeing. I think this is why this is a piece of why I think this matters. A there's a policy probably that requires that door to be glass. I doubt that's an accident. And B there is at least a theoretical policy that is on some level in tension with the realities of volunteer work. And this is where I think the policy tends to get the bad name, right? Well, you know, they're asking us to do the impossible. We can't always have two people in the room. And that's certainly true. But your safety as a volunteer is to some degree jeopardized unless there's cameras or something in the room. Sure. Which yeah. I bet there are. There are not. Oh, okay. Um, so, and there may be some, you go to a great church. And so I am almost certain that your leadership team has thought this all through. Great church. And so I, I hate to use you, your church as an example because I, I don't want to, throw it under the bus. But let's take a situation that could easily happen in a church that is not your situation, but is adjacent to it. Let's say there's only two volunteers in a first and second grade room, and a first grader has to go to a bath, go to the bathroom, or a kindergartner, somebody young enough that they might need help. Yep. That is a very realistic situation. Mm-hmm. And our church does have policies when it comes to those younger classrooms. I'm in the older classroom where like, if a student needs to excuse themselves, I can just send them down the hall and they can just do their thing. So that's where I think that they can get away with one teacher. One. Mm -hmm. but Especially with the glass door. Yeah, exactly. But it it's not... It, because there's no opportunity for a teacher to ever be alone one-on-one -on -one with a student. Yeah. And so... And there's, there's yeah. the policy, right? Right. And why is that? It's because it's dangerous and complicated to be alone with a per with a kid. Yeah, first of all, for the kid. It's it's really not about first and foremost protecting the volunteer. No. It's first and foremost about protecting the the kid. You know, I I, I one time years ago I had a dad come up to me and the, our church policy was whoever checks him in checks him out. They're giving it a you know, a little sticker that this is their kid. It was a nursery situation. And so the mom was given the little sign in sticker and the dad went to check out their kid and they were newer to the church and the staff, the volunteer very appropriately said, I'm, I'm sorry, I can only check this out, this kid out to the person who checked them in. That's our policy. And the dad got all sorts of bent out of shape. And, and the, I got called in to kind of talk with the dad and I said, hey, do you want just anybody who happens to randomly find the sticker to be able to check your kid out? Do you think that sounds safe in the middle of the inner city? Dad was mm. like, no, not at all. Well, then this is the best we can do. It's not you personally. If my wife checks my kids in, I don't get to check them out either. And they know me. And they've been told that if that I'm going to test them sometimes. And if they let me check it in, check the kids out, when I didn't check them in, they're going to be in trouble. Yeah. It's just because your kids matter and we want to keep them safe. And again, I think policies in those situations are about pausing and asking the hard questions like, who could get harmed? We all want to assume the best of everybody, but if we assume the worst for a moment, you know, let's, let's pretend, for example, that we believe in the depravity of, of man. <laughs> Yep. What could go wrong and how do we protect everybody? How do we love people well when we've got hundreds of people to love instead of just three? And, and for me, whether it's a policy about kids or a policy about how to take care of the offering or a policy about what kind of activities are appropriate in youth group, and I'm not trying to say anything should or shouldn't be, but I have heard some stories about activities I know somebody who, as a youth pastor 25, 30 years ago, they would hook a car battery up to a metal chair, and the opening game was who can sit in the chair the longest. <gasps> Are you kidding me? 100%. 
I actually know two different people who played the same game in different youth groups. What? Yeah. This was apparently a thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't know there needed to be a policy about that. But, <laughs> but you can, can you see how that might happen? Man, kids just want to play something. They're super competitive. They're like, you know, they love, you know, kind of, the, let's go. Come on, we're going to do this. And the youth leader gets caught up in the middle of that and is all excited about it. And maybe not that game, but something like it. And it's the policy that protects the youth leader from getting caught up in the moment and saying, and this is the beauty of it. They get to say to their teenagers, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And the teenagers say, well, I want to, you know, you're no fun. It's not me. It's the church. It's the policy. I can't, I'm, I don't have any choice. And this is a huge gift that policies give parishioners. You know, like one of our policies at one of my churches was you can't give financial gifts to anybody in the church without clearing it with leadership if you're in leadership of, I think it was $50 or more. And the reason it exists, it happened, is because two different times, one parishioner swindled another parishioner out of thousands of dollars hmm. because the, the second parishioner felt bad. It was like, oh, let me help you out. Hmm. Policy was there to protect. Yeah. You know, and it's, again, it's, it's the broad picture of what could people do wrong? How could people take advantage of Because the one thing we know about church is that if church is being done right, it's a place where lots of sinners gather together. Yeah. Well, okay. So how do you how do you decide what is a once-off and what actually needs a policy? Because here's the thing. In my line of work, people dread what they call the group slap. This is somebody did something dumb, and now there's this big message that goes out to everybody, hey, don't do this dumb thing. Everybody's like, well, why are you all treating us like we're the dumb ones? Like, why Why are we being told, like, don't do this? Like, of course, we're not doing that. Thank you. I, like, so how do you, when, what's just a disciplinary issue and what actually deserves a policy? In both churches I've worked at, this was decided by a group. So in one church, it was frequently the lead pastor and I would kick around an idea. And one of the most important things I can say about this, whoever this group of people is, it has to be a safe, free-flowing conversation. I felt fully free to say in those meetings with the lead pastor, come on, that doesn't need a policy. That's happened twice in eight years. Hmm. And sometimes I would say that. Sometimes, far more often, it would probably be in the opposite direction. I'd be like, man, we need a policy for this. And the lead pastor, because I'm the more of the rules-oriented person, and my lead pastor would be like, no, we don't. We just need to tell the person not to do that. And I'd be like, well, okay. Um, and, you know, and it was this kind of free-flowing, ultimately not free-flowing among equals. Whatever the lead pastor decided, that's what we were doing. But there was this kind of free-flowing conversation initially between the two of us and then ultimately frequently going to the staff and getting their input on it. Or in the other church, there was a team of people, somebody representing the volunteers, somebody representing the finances, and a couple other people, including myself. And the team evaluated what policy needed to be. And in both situations, I think the group decision-making created a sense of buy-in and a sense of wisdom around the policy that mm. ensured that it made some sense. So I wrote a, I think it was a six-page policy on how money needed to be handled at one point at the church I was at in Boston. Six pages. Wow. But that's because churches handle money in some weird ways, right? Like, like I said, we get money dumped in buckets on a weekly basis. On the way out of church, it's conceivable that Tickets to something or some book or something or t-shirts are being sold at some table and the person who's selling them, all they have is a bag that was handed to them with $50 and change and they were told, sell those t-shirts. Uh -huh. Or in the middle of youth group, the, everybody's going to Six Flags and so you're collecting $45 or whatever from every kid. 
so there's all these weird ways we collect money that need to be thought about because if money goes missing, I don't, I want every parishioner to be able to say it couldn't possibly have been me and you know it. Well, and I've, I'm even starting to think about, I'm wondering if in, in your emails, you have gotten examples of times when a church as a whole got into legal trouble because they failed to create a policy that would have addressed a certain fallout, but because they didn't provide the right amount of oversight or forethought, uh, they're in trouble for it. Oh, yeah. The, the church that I was in in Boston rented a location. One of their locations was a rental space from a different church. The church they were renting from, coming back to this as a policy we've talked about earlier, the church got in really big trouble because they were something in the vein of child abuse was alleged and they couldn't prove it didn't happen. I have no idea if it did or didn't. I don't actually know all of the details, but I know the church shut down. Oh, wow. Wow. It's a but small wait, so church. Why was the church at fault? Just because they couldn't prove it didn't happen? Because it happened in the church building during a church event. It's not that like they got I don't know that they got sued or anything, but ultimately if that's what people hear about you in the newspaper or online, mm. what do you think that's going to do for the church? You yeah. know, you talked about evangelism a little bit ago. A lot of policies protect the church from looking really stupid <laughs> or or corrupt or dangerous. And that kind of reputation is really harmful to the gospel. Yeah. Well, and like you said earlier, if we know anything about the church, it's comprised of sinners. And mm -hmm. that includes its staff, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And so, like, if we can just prevent opportunities for sinful people to engage in sinful behavior, even the staff, the volunteers, people that attend the church, whatever, like every level of the church would do well to try to address the fact that we're a bunch of sinners trying to do this thing. Absolutely. I mean, this is why in the context of a policy in which married male staff couldn't meet with female parishioners unless there was a camera camera in the room or hole in the door. Those were the two, that was the basic rule. Camera in the room or hole in the door. And that meant they couldn't meet with, with women off-site, which was very inconvenient. So, I, you know, not at a coffee shop, whatever. But in the context of explaining that policy many years ago, my lead pastor made a distinction between Reformed theology and holiness theology, because I'm in the Pentecostal world. And he said the Reformed theology believes in the total depravity of man. Holiness theology believes in the total depravity of me. Hmm. And so we have very specific lines we draw because we believe we could sin any mo in any moment. All it takes for me to be tempted to steal money is for me to get in an accident, total my car, my heating system goes out in my house. Suddenly I'm $10,000 under and I, it's cash. It's right there. I'll pay it back next week. Yeah. It's, it's not a giant jump from there to accidentally having stolen thousands and thousands of dollars. But if there's always a second person who's not related to you in the room, that protects you. And that's a brilliant and beautiful thing. Even if it means it's hard to figure out when to do the money stuff because you got to get somebody else in the room. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Hmm. Well, I would like to revise my mockery of you and say maybe <laughs> you will not be the least liked professor on campus. Maybe after hearing some of this, you might be the most thanked professor on campus. <laughs> well, at least if I'm least liked, it will be for other reasons. It will That's be because of true. my innate sarcasm or whatever, not oh, because yeah. of the subject matter I'm teaching. 
Oh man, I've been friends with you for over 20 years. If any of your students want to come get some dirt, like let me know. Yeah. I'll I'll help them Thanks. out. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're welcome. That's what what are, what are friends for? Not we don't have that. a policy on this show that says we can't talk about the other co-host. Yeah, that's true. All right, fine. <laughs> We're having a policy conversation after we hang up. <laughs> yeah, I don't attend board meetings. Um, Good thing we don't right. have a board. Oh, yeah, that's right. See, the, there you go. Okay, well, I'd like to turn to the audience and say, uh, what are some of the things that you have seen play out in your church and in your context, regardless of your role? Are you an attendee? Are you a member? Are you an involved uh, member? Are you on staff in some way? What has been your experience with church policy, good, bad, or otherwise? Uh, because clearly it's necessary, and we want to make sure that those who have opportunity to craft policy have uh, all of the information necessary. So we'd love to hear from you. What's your experience been like? Yeah. And if you have any good stories or good articles or videos or whatever, we I, there's a lot to share here. I, I'm looking forward to hearing it. 100%. Well, this is our Summer in the Psalms series, and I am excited to hear from you, Josh from Missouri. What stuck out to you in our Psalms reading this week? Whew, I can't say this is a deep and profound thought, but as I was going through Psalm 119, uh, which is part of our reading in this wonderful Summer in the Psalms series that we're doing, I am enjoying or have been enjoying slowly and leisurely working my way through Psalm 119. It's a fascinating meditation on the law of God and its wonder and beauty. And I find myself praying with the psalmist, asking God to make me love it the way he loves it. Mm. But, you know, and, and actually I'm going to just, I had some other thing, but I'm going to make that my thought. My thought is when the psalmist looks at the law of God, the word of God to him is the com appears to me to be the command of God. And it is the command of God that orders the universe and therefore should order me. And when mm. he looks at the word of God, the command, it is beautiful and inspiring and good and safe and lovely. And I don't think I think of law the way he does, and I want to. That's my thought. That's such a good thought. And I really appreciate you sharing it today because I am just a couple of psalms behind you, and I have not started 119 yet. And I would love to tuck that thought away and read Psalm 119 in that light. So that's good. Mm. What about you? What have you been thinking about from our lovely Summer in the Psalms series? Summer Psalm series. Summer Summer Psalm series? Um, a summer in the Psalms. Yeah, I think when we first started this, you threatened to put a P in oh, front of I series. Oh, I want it. I, one of these years, I am I am determined we are going to have a Summer in the Psalms. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that sounds very much in line with our sense of humor. And we'll confuse the vast majority of people who look at it. I, I think it will be splendid. <laughs> I'm going to share my psalm thought. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm looking at Psalm 117 in particular, but this is a thought that has carried with me through a number of psalms recently. And so it, this just says, Praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. There you go. I read the whole Psalm right here on the podcast, but mm. his steadfast love, which is the ESV's way of translating the word hesed and hesed is notoriously difficult to translate because it is not just love, and it's not just faithfulness, but it it's also tied to this idea of covenant and God's promise to keep the covenant even when his people were unfaithful. And 
there's just a lot of overtones to this word that don't all come across very well in any one English phrase or word. And so just like we talked a, a lot about Yahweh Sabaot in a previous episode, and you allowed me to see that in a potential new light, I'm wondering what Hesed meant cognitively and emotionally to its original authors. It is used so, so frequently in the Psalms, over and over and over again. They extol the Hesed of Yahweh. And I just want to pay attention to that word every time it comes up to start expanding my understanding of that word and its potential range of meaning. That's so good. I am fascinated and am curious what you find and will be looking, continuing to look at that word myself as well, because you're right. It's one that, man, whatever we think it means is going to mean a lot to the rest of the Bible. Yeah. Hmm. All right. That brings us at last to the which Josh question. Ooh, are you ready? I am so ready. All right. Well, here it is. Which Josh will preach for socks and underwear or not in? <laughs> well, uh, you haven't heard the story yet. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Which yes. does indicate it is not me. <laughs> right. I have never preached in socks or underwear. I presume Wait, you um, had them on beneath <laughs> all of the other things. <laughs> I always preach commando. Uh, it's the yeah. command. No, wait. Oh, geez. Whew. Okay. So we finally got into the heresy. All right. But uh, oh. so... I, so I got a chance to preach this last weekend, and it was great. Uh, shout out to Dean. Thank you for inviting me to come and preach. I always love coming up to your church. And I I knew that they always give me like a, a small honorarium, like a little stipend that just says, thank you for preaching this week. Here's a little small amount of money for the work you put into making this happen. So I, I knew that going into it, and so I bought a couple of books that I needed to prepare for the sermon. So I'm like, all right, great. Yeah, the sermon bought me some books. That's great. And then the day of the sermon came along, and I am rummaging through my sock drawer, and I cannot find any dress socks. None. I mean, this tells you how I dress on a normal basis. But it also tells you that I have teenagers that just steal socks. I feel like this is their one mission in life, is to steal socks. And so they just have disappeared. And I found one old raggedy pair with a bunch of holes in them that I'm like, okay, nobody's going to see these holes, but that's just uncomfortable and I don't want to wear them. And so I put them on. And I'm like, it's all I can find and I've got to go. And I'm like, wait a minute. If I leave now, I could stop at the store and buy new socks. And hey, haven't I been wanting to buy new underwear as well? And hey, don't I get an honorarium for this? This is perfect. I will preach today and it will buy me socks and underwear. So, yeah. Thank you, That's Dean, awesome. to you and your church for buying me socks and underwear for a sermon. That's absolutely delightful. I'm so glad that somebody has finally provided you with socks and underwear. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. So there you go. We'll preach for is. socks and underwear. I've got my sign ready to go. I'm heading out to the freeway tonight. I will preach for socks and underwear. All right. Well, hey, you ready to do this again next week? I'm ready. I'm looking forward to it. All right. I'll talk to you then. All right.